Hello everyone, Mr. Navarrete here, and today I am going to go over bonding homework number one. So let's just jump in. Our first question asks us to define what a covalent bond is. Breaking down what the word covalent means, well, co just means to share, and the valent portion is talking about the valence electrons. or the electrons in the outermost shell. Putting those two words together, a covalent bond is when atoms share their electrons. Let's move on to our next question. Our next question asks, what is an ionic bond? Well, the main difference between an ionic bond and a covalent bond is that in this case, atoms are held together due to electrostatic attraction. Atoms with a high electronegativity are able to take an electron from another atom. This creates a cation and an anion, just like on a magnet, a positive side and a negative side. The positive and the negative charge is what holds them together. Let's move on to the next question. Now, for question three, it asks, what is a polar covalent bond? Well, as mentioned earlier, covalent bonds are when atoms share electrons. But just like when we are told to share something, it's not always shared equally. One person always has a larger share. Atoms work the same way. There is an unequal share between electrons in a covalent bond. If an atom has a larger electronegativity, it's going to hold those electrons a lot closer to them versus the other atom, which has a smaller electronegativity. Our next question asks, what type of bond is formed when a metal bonds with a non-metal? Well, metals have really low electronegativities and non-metals have really high electronegativities, meaning a non-metal can take an electron from a metal, creating an anion and a cation. They are not sharing electrons, but instead they're held together because of the positive and negative charges. This makes them form an ionic bond. Now, if a non-metal and another non-metal form a bond, what type of bond would they form? Non-metals tend to have higher electronegativities, meaning that not one atom is going to be able to completely take an electron from each other. Instead, they're going to share the electrons. Since they're sharing their electrons, they form a covalent bond. Now, our next question asks, well, what are some of the characteristics of ionic bonds? Well, to name a few, ionic bonds have high melting points, high boiling points, they also dissociate in water, Just like when we were doing our precipitation reactions and we saw that the ions would completely separate in water. Because they dissociate in water, their solutions are able to conduct electricity. However, one of the more clear properties of an ionic bond is that they're able to form what is called a crystal structure or a crystal lattice and we'll see some examples of that in a, in a bit so these are ionic bonds 
Well, what are some characteristics of covalent bonds? Covalent bonds are quite the opposite. They have low melting points. low boiling points they do not dissociate in water their solutions do not conduct electricity And there's one more, but I'm going to save it for the next question. What are the general properties of a compound that has a polar covalent bond? Well, they share the same characteristics as normal covalent bonds. The main difference is that they're able to form weak structures. While the structures that they form are very similar to the ones found in ionic bonds, ionic structures are held by ions. It's the positive and the negative charge that holds them together. Polar covalent bonds don't have that charge present holding them together. And it's for that reason that these bonds and these structures are fairly easy to break and therefore pretty weak. Now let's list some examples for each type of bond. I'm gonna choose some of my favorites. For my ionic bond, I'm going to choose potassium iodide. Potassium iodide is also used as a disinfectant. For my covalent bond, I'm going to choose methane. Let me label them. Ionic. This would be my covalent. And this one, I just like the structure. Uh, we're going to learn about it in the future, but I just really like the tetrahedron that it forms. And for polar covalent, I'm just going to choose a really popular one, the hydrogen monoxide. Now, don't steal mine. Try to come up with some on your own. Let's move on to question 10. So question 10 asks to explain the difference between the structures between ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Well, as mentioned earlier, ionic compounds form what we call lattice structures. And those are held between the charges between the cation and the anion. Um, they make really strong structures. Um, they're really sturdy. But on the other hand, covalent bonds don't really have that structure. They can form networks. But because they're not held by cations and anions, there's no electrostatic attraction. They're not as strong. They can break really, really easily. Let's move on to the back page. So it says draw a picture of what a sodium chloride lattice looks like. Now your drawing does not have to be perfect. Mine isn't, but give it your best shot. I'm gonna fast forward the drawing so you don't have to see me go through all of my attempts. So this is my crystal lattice. Um, the main thing to see is how the ions interact with each other and how they're being held equally. Sodium has a chlorine atom there and a chlorine atom as well. It's all of these little structures that kind of keep everything held together. It's not being pulled by one it's not only being pulled just by one ion, it's also being pulled in another direction. But it's also being pushed away in this direction. And it is this network, it is this, it is this structure that makes it really strong and sturdy. And now that we know what they look like, let's 
calculated some bonds. First up, we have hydrochloric acid. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. So when we find the difference, 3.0 minus 2.1, we get a difference of 0 0.9. If we look at our chart, we see that 0 0.9 lands us at polar covalent. So that means the type of bond that we form is a polar covalent bond. Next we have magnesium fluoride. Magnesium has an electronegativity of 1.2, while fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. If we take the difference, 4.0 minus 1.2, we get 2.8. Looking at our chart, the 2.8 lands us over at ionic. So that means we form an ionic bond. Another way to tell is we have a metal, magnesium, with a non-metal. Also would form an ionic bond. Let's move on to our next question. Here we have Carbon dioxide. Carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, while oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Now, if we find the difference, 3.5 minus 2.5, we get a difference of 1.0. Now, while our chart might say that this is a polar covalent bond, when we draw out the molecule, carbon, oxygen and oxygen. Carbon is being pulled equally on both sides. So it is not a polar bond. It's simply just a covalent bond. Remember, our chart are only estimations. And once we start getting into the shapes and specifically Vesper models, um, this will all make a little bit more sense. So on to our next question. Here we have a bromine molecule. Bromine has an electronegativity of 2.8. So when we find the difference, 2.8 minus 2.8, we get zero, making this a pure covalent bond. For our next one, we have CO2 again, but I'm just going to put our same answer that we did for C. So let's move on to, to our next question. Next up, we have hydrofluoric acid. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1, while fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. When we find the difference, 4.0 minus 2.1, we get 1.9. Here, again, when we look at our chart, it says it is an ionic bond. However, we have two nonmetals. So in this case, it would just be a polar covalent bond. Again, our charts are only estimations. Let's move on to our next one. Next, we have sodium fluoride. Sodium has an electronegativity of 0 0.9, while fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. Finding the difference, 4.0 minus 0 0.9, we get an electronegativity of, or a difference of 3.1. This one, looking at our chart, it is clearly ionic. So I'm just gonna put an ionic bond. move on to our next one. Here we have iodine heptafluoride. Iodine has an electronegativity of 2.5, while fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. Here we find the difference, so 4.0 minus 2.5, and we get 1.5. Here, looking at our chart, we get 
polar covalent. However, when we draw out the molecule, this is going to look a little funny. Looking at it, it looks like they're all on the same plane. However, these five are on the same plane, but this one is above, so coming out of the screen, and this one is below, below the screen. So each of these is pulling with an equal amount of force. And the one on top, then the one below is also pulling. So this wouldn't be a polar covalent bond. This one would simply be a covalent bond. Next, we have an oxygen molecule. Oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. So 3.5 minus 3.5 gives us a difference of zero and this would make it looking at our chart it would make it a covalent bond lastly we're going to move on to nitrogen dioxide nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0 while oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5 Finding the difference, 3.5 minus 3.0, we get 0.5. And looking at our chart, we get a polar covalent bond. And that was our last one. And that's it. If there are any questions, don't forget to send me or Mr. Morgan a message on Schoology. Um, other than that, stay safe and I'll catch y'all on the next one.